All right. Good day. Good evening. And happy, healthy messaging today, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, obviously, for the newer listeners, we like to rock out about health, business, and lifestyle here on the Live the Fuel podcast show. Well, today, I think it's going to actually pass through all three of those categories because I'm going to about I'm going to record today with a new guest host, and I've never had an episode about what we're about to talk about. So I'm excited because I've been doing this like four years. I'm 350 shows recorded and I can't keep up with how much uh, new technology I come across. And I'm excited about technology today because this is going to impact uh, people's healthy lifestyles and mobility. And uh, who better than our guest co-host to give us some background on mobility, why it is important and why it's super cool to have technology because this gentleman has been working with this IHMC organization for a little while now. And they got some new tech coming out by the name of Quix, Q-U-I-X. We're going to define that today as well. And long story short, I've met uh, through the CrossFit world and the fitness world, lots of uh, veterans, uh, people that were injured in car accidents. I've done Spartan races with people that are uh, paraplegic. And this gentleman might know about that too. Uh, so yeah, that's right. We're talking about exoskeletons, robotics, engineering, and obviously uh, back to my core point, healthy lifestyles. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, Shout out to Maxwell Ivy for hooking us up. Mark Daniel, sir. Welcome to the hello, show. Hello. Yeah. How are you? I'm doing great. It's yeah. a Monday. Most people don't <laughs> yeah. look forward to it. I've been looking forward to Monday for a while now. <laughs> I know, right? So <laughs> so and you you're so you're airing from Florida, just so people understand. It yes, is sir. super hot here in Pennsylvania today. But then again, it's Florida, so you guys pretty much are always hot. So I mean, it, it, to to us, us is hot is kind of relative term because right now <laughs> it's it's raining outside and it's not really hot, but you got the humidity, hundred percent humidity, and it's probably eighty something degrees out there. So that's not really hot to me. Yeah, but, you know, most people they they die on that one. We're about to get. We were supposed to get a Florida week, as I call it, because uh, <laughs> Saturday through Wednesday we were supposed to have nonstop rain. And I was like, oh, that's, that's a week in Florida. I used to get out there in business all the time. And then all of a sudden it changed. So it actually hasn't rained at all today. But all that, you could feel the moisture. You could feel the humidity. And oh, yeah. It's funny because I live in Allentown, Pennsylvania, where we're airing tonight, and uh, which is an hour north of Philadelphia mm-hmm. and an hour and a half west of New York City. And for years, a lot of my friends that I grew up with or work with, uh, it seems like the Lehigh Valley, which is where I'm at, people retire to you. <laughs> So yeah. I feel like half of the populace here eventually ends up there. <laughs> so Oh, yeah. yeah. I feel like that, you know, just walking through Pensacola, you know, I meet people from all over the world all the time. I did Uber and Lyft around here for a while just to, you know, get experience talking with different people. Yeah. And it was just amazing to me the just the various, you know, locations where people come from, where they go, where they spend time, and then they come back to Pensacola. So it's, it's really neat. We're kind of like a, we've been compared, you know, we talk about a little bit like, like a small DC, how DC go. has people from everywhere all the time. Yeah. It's like that here in Pensacola, but on a smaller scale, and it's just not as well known. So I actually got to experience some of that, and maybe it's the warm states, uh, but years ago when I left to move west to be a firefighter, uh, I, 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 I fought fire based out of Arizona. And Scottsdale and Phoenix is kind of the same way. It's, I met people from all over the world there as well. And it's funny because actually my old, the, the buddy of mine that we, I used to crash on his couch when I had my days off from fire because our base was in the mountains. So when they finally gave us true days off where we, had, we could travel beyond three hours of callback, I would go down to Scottsdale and party with him. Anyway, so he's moving there tomorrow. He's leaving. <laughs> He's been here for a few years. And he's like, I'm done. He's like, I'm going back. I said, let's go back to Arizona. I was like, dude, it's it's June. I said, you're <laughs> about to move back into the 115 degree heat, which is July, August, September. I was like, yeah. bad timing, bro. <laughs> yeah, and especially like the, the the huge change from up there to you know to Arizona. Yeah, you know, like he lived there for years. Uh, so when I went out for fire, that that's how he and I actually became better friends, and then. Uh, when I moved to Colorado, he moved to San Francisco, and then he eventually moved back here. When I moved back here to the East Coast, and he's been here for years, like I've been, and he's like, "Yeah, I'm, I'm ready to go back." I'm like, "Okay, good luck, man." So, <laughs> I, I was yeah. I was literally uh, carrying furniture out of his loft into a uh, trailer uh, yesterday for him. So my friends oh, are like, man. "Aren't you 42 years old?" He's like, "Do you still move people?" I said, <laughs> "Dude, like even my wife, she's like, why are you moving people?" I'm like, "I like to pick things up and put them down." Okay. Right? If it, if, it, if it benefits somebody, great. 
So. Yeah. yeah. Oh man. Yeah. I don't know how y'all stay up there in, um, in Pennsylvania though. I spent, uh, what, six, eight months in uh, Western Maryland and uh, oh, right yeah. outside, right outside of Cumberland in a small town called old town. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. So, um, right after the Cybathlon, if you, um, you know, on the website and all that stuff, we had the uh, Mina V2 is what we took to the 2016 Cybathlon in Switzerland. Yeah. Now again, for the people listening, Mina V2 okay. is the second version of your, I guess, first exoskeleton launch, right? Okay. Well, um, just to catch people <laughs> up, I'll, I'll make it real quick. I've done it a full, uh, a few times. I was going to say, you could probably do this. <laughs> yep. And so, while, uh, you, while you do this, I'm actually going to screen share the site because you okay. guys always have videos playing while you explain this real quick. All right. So um, what, um, what we're seeing here is the 2016 Cybathlon, but I actually started with IHMC in 2010. Um, I came in, it was about two and a half years after my accident. They were on their first um, paraplegic assistive mobility device or exoskeleton. Uh, they brought me in, did a little interview and introduced me to the engineers, showed me the first exoskeleton, which we called MENA. And um, it was very, very crude put together but it worked and I was able to uh, walk and all that and that one the uh, second version we worked on called x1 which will be a gold one in some of the videos and stuff that one is our second one we worked with NASA on that which uh, really contributed a lot to the uh, actuators and stuff that we have now on the third version which is MENA v2 that's the one that I'm standing in right now on the screen yeah. and the one that we took to the 2016 Cybathlon uh, where we got silver, we got the silver medal there. We only we we were only behind by a few seconds and a handful of points, which was wow. really close. Yeah, it was our it was a it was a it was a great day for us just in the in, you know in our achievement and completing what we came to do. But um, now we're working on the quick exoskeleton, which um, which is a huge improvement with with what doesn't look like a whole lot of difference. So the the main part of the legs there, the thighs, right. the knees, and the ankles are powered just like on Mina V2. But with quicks, if you look at the back, there are two more actuators that connect up at the uh, the hip level, and they give you uh, adduction and abduction, which is like the ability to sidestep. Say you're standing at the sink washing dishes, and you right. need something, you know, four or five feet away. You don't turn and walk down there and then turn back. You step two or three times to the left, grab what you need, and then pull back over to the sink and keep washing dishes. So up, up until this new mock-up that I'm showing right now, you're talking about like you guys have never been able to go left and right very well, right? I don't, if, if at all. Uh, yes. So uh, everything to do with uh, steering and balance is on me in Mina V2. Okay. And when we go to uh, being able to use the extra two motors in the quick exoskeleton, it'll help us with pivoting that weight over, you know, your loaded leg, the load, yeah. the, the leg that you're not swinging. You know what I mean? So we can shift weight over that, which will be able to speed our steps and it'll help us implement balance into the machine where I don't have to balance and control and work everything. We're going to start putting more load on the machine. Cool. Or more cognitive load because right now it's technically handling all the physical load. I was going to say, there's, there's some <laughs> connectivity there going on. So, yep. so, this, yeah, so let's, so if we're talking about this and we, you know, we, we're going to segue sooner or later into this. Like, dude, how did you even fall into a pilot program like and obviously you hinted at your accident right so let's let's yeah. get a little bit of the more of that personal backstory because i love i like history i like backstories and and i love inspirational shifts uh, for people that changes their lives forever so um well i mean it, the shift for me was at was at 18 you know so i was paralyzed at 18 up until that point i had I had grown up outside pretty much. Um, I come from a blue collar family. My dad's a plumber. All my uncles are welders, electricians, framers, you know, concrete. Um, and so I grew up doing those things. I worked on a job site since I was a little kid. And up to 18, it was always, you know, it was always labor work and, and you know, and trade skills and things like that. And then I turned 18 and started working in a fab shop in my hometown here and made it about about five months before I um, before I fell asleep on the way home, we worked seven days a week, anywhere from ten hours or up a day, and uh, I lasted as long as I could in that kind of realm until uh, just couldn't handle the load, workload anymore. I was stressing myself, you know, running really hard you know, at work and then getting off and not wanting to sleep like I should. Get up at five o'clock, go back to work. And the cycle caught up with me. Fell asleep on the way home. Flipped my truck uh, seven times. Got thrown out of the passenger door, if I remember right, and I woke up in the hospital, paralyzed. And didn't really know for about a week. And then, you know, of course, they make the announcement to you when you try to get out of bed and you can't. <laughs> uh, yeah, you might want to stay there. You can't walk. So what so. was the actual, because uh, I know there's different levels of paralysis and accidents. And, and uh, I actually, I used to, I'm 
done a lot of things in my life. So I used to work at a ski resort here in Pennsylvania, the Pocono Mountains, okay. uh, just for a side side hustle. And uh, it wasn't really for the money, but I was coaching kids <laughs> ski racing and helping set up uh, the race courses and everything. And the cool thing was our mountain was one of the rare mountains that had an adaptive program with a whole bunch of volunteers who just worked with people who were in the adaptive field of, of skiing, meaning that, okay, some might have been paraplegic, some might have been blind, some might have been missing limbs. Uh, it just depends on their adaptive uh, trait. And then we would set up a race every year on the snow and they would set up a race course and they would race. I mean, you'd have blind skiers with a, uh, a coach in front of them with a with a mic microphone and everything, and they're talking to each other and telling them when to turn as they're going through the Ooh, race course. I was that's like, trust. dude, that's a lot of trust, bro. I was like, <laughs> well, I'm sitting there, like, the first time we hosted that race, I'm sitting there like, that is awesome. And then I know, there, was, there was like a young girl coming down. She had a, a right arm and a left leg, and that was it. And then she had... Uh, adaptive basically cane ski pole things long enough to reach the other ski i'm like she's skiing on one ski one ski pole and she's turning and i'm like yeah. how are you leaning over and controlling your body mass without i it's it's so inspiring so oh, I, yeah. I just want to share that for you because i'm like I'm, I'm just trying to picture i mean it's a powerful shift when you weren't born that way right this came from an accident yeah. Uh, which is unfortunate, uh, and it really changes your life forever. <laughs> so yeah, well, I mean, the, the, the accidents come along, you know, and and from the outside looking in, and even you know, in my position, you know, at the moment looking at the situation that I was in, it, it seems like you know a huge detriment for me to be 18 years old, just starting my life, you know, my adult life, and then for the accident to happen and have to you know restart, figure it all out over again. But, you know, I'm, I'm 31 now, you know, it's been, uh, it'll be 13 years in October. And, um, and really, looking back at the situation, it couldn't have come at a better time. And, and I say that at, you know, at 18 years old, I'd figured out my life, I had a career plan, I was on that plan, and I was moving forward. But I mean, really looking at the experiences up till then, I grew up riding dirt bikes, go-karts, four-wheelers, skateboards, bicycles, running through the woods, fishing, hunting, you know, I spent- Good, just, healthy, youthful adrenaline chunk. Oh, yeah. oh yeah. Everything you can think of as far as far away from, you know, computers and electronics and sitting still as possible, man. And, and in all of those learning experiences growing up, I, I learned agility, balance, things that you, you know, that, that can be picked up, but are there a lot easier to pick up when you are a child? You know, and so I, I developed that sense, you know, growing up, you know, real physical body side and, you know, and really endurance based. And then the accident came. And while the wheelchair is, you know, I, I get aggravated with it every day. I don't want to be in the wheelchair, you know, of course, but not being a martyr, looking at it like, okay, I'm 18 years old. I have my whole life in front of me. And now what do I do with it? And it's really an opportunity at this point to where I look at it one of these days with what we're doing here at the exoskeleton and some of the other uh, research that I'm helping with uh, at the VA in Cleveland and stuff, we're going to turn the accident that I had at 18 years old, where we have somebody that's physical, they're, they're, you know, they're blue collar, they work, you know, on a job site, something like that for a living. Whenever I look at it now, it's like I got in my accident and because I got in my accident at that time, hopefully I can help that 18 year old overcome the, the problem that he has by giving him better tools to work with. I was given a wheelchair. And I'm not complaining because this wheelchair has taken me thousands of miles and in all kinds of crazy places. But the idea that, you know, maybe 20 years from now when I'm old and feeble, an 18 year old kid will get paralyzed and then we'll be able to pass him this exoskeleton or a similar device and he can go back to work after he heals. Yeah. He can stand at a table, he can work, you know, a drill press, you know, things like that, that really make the difference in that world. Yeah, it's interesting because like, there's a couple of things we, I don't want to completely skip over completely. Like one, or kudos to you to actually somehow then go from that to here. Two, I, I do want to recognize the fact that I have fallen asleep at the wheel when I was younger and hit a telephone pole and, and totaled a car. And uh, been there, done that, not recommended. And for the same exact reasons, I was working multiple jobs. Uh, I just, the way I grew up, farm kid, just work, work, work. You know, I was paying my way through my own school. I never planned to go to school. So I just said, okay, well, I'll, I'll take a full-time corporate job. Let him take his classes on the side when in my free time. And then I pick up a side job at night, uh, bouncing at a bar. So the bars don't close till two, three o'clock in the morning. So back to your point, right? Sleep deprivation, tired, and yeah, the rest is history. So I was lucky I really enough. I love it though. I couldn't complain, you know? Yeah. Like what if I hit somebody, you know? Yeah. 
Same Luckily, thing. I was alone. I, I, you know, I was alone in my truck. It was later in the evening, and I was on. I was on a road that I was lucky that I hit. I was lucky that I hit three mailboxes where there would happen to be three or four houses around. Oh, there you go. My, my truck might, actually, might slow you a little bit, but uh, well, no, it woke me up. From yeah. what the police, the police report says, uh, hit three mailboxes. Um, you know, overcorrected the wheel, flipped down a hill. I got ejected by somebody's driveway, and my truck went into their yard about another forty or fifty feet. Wow. Yep. So I mean, and, you know, and like I said, it's an opportunity. You know, the, these things they look bad from the outside in. Anytime that we all, you know, anybody gets hit with a challenge, it, you know, it looks like a devastation. But we, you know, it, it's it's a little bit cliche, but the idea of you know the phoenix coming from the ashes, you know, you, you have to. Whenever that happened to me at 18 years old, there, you know, it took a few years. It took time, and I don't even want to say that. You know, I don't want to say I pinpointed time when it happened, but at some point, I had to look back at the life that I had built up to the point I was at, and I had to throw a match on it and just let it burn down. Except the fact that I was not that person anymore. I'm not going to be that person anymore. And so now I have to be something I, I can still be as good as I was. I just have to be different. I like what you went with there because one, it's kind of a favorite Phoenix. We were just joking around about Arizona, uh, <laughs> but I made a lot of mistakes throughout life and there is no such thing as perfection, right? I think I've, we all need to be reminded that I actually am really trying to remove that word from my vocabulary because so many people are like, Oh, well, you know, nobody's perfect or, you know, and like, yes, nobody is perfect. Stop trying to shoot for perfection the biggest yeah. thing is what can we do to learn from these changes what can we do to create innovation create a, a whole new path for ourselves so it's kind of funny you said phoenix because i literally have a giant phoenix tattooed on my back <laughs> after after firefighting for those two years literally fighting fire shifted my whole mindset like my whole life into the future i never planned on becoming an entrepreneur years later and stuff like that i never planned on becoming a podcaster and stuff but it was like it was one of those key moments in my life. Well, granted, it didn't take rolling my truck seven times becoming paraplegic, right? But it's like, okay, <laughs> there's these things that happen in life. And sometimes they're profound and they're massive and they shift everything. And it's like, okay, what can you do to turn that into a positive shift, right? What can you do to bring growth out of that? Because yeah. we're all dealt crazy decks of cards, right? So yeah. uh, if you're going to get it shuffled up, like, oh, well, how are you going to deal the next hand, right? So. In your case, next thing you know, because again, you said this earlier in the show, you're like, oh, next thing you know, you're you're driving Uber, and, and uh, which by the way, awesome. Like, obviously, you must have a <laughs> modified vehicle uh, to allow for that, right? Are you doing a um, van or? Uh, no, uh, well, I, I've actually um, since I've been in the wheelchair, I've never driven a van. Okay. <laughs> I've always had a I've always had a pickup truck of some kind. Oh, cool. And, until I started doing the Uber and Lyft, and then I had I, I had a little uh, Ford Escort for a little okay. while, four door Ford Escort. And um and now I have uh, Nissan Xterra. Oh yeah, there we go. Now yeah. you, you're, now because you're working with I, IHMC, you you don't have time to do Uber and stuff anymore, right? Or are you? Uh, I mean, I could. Um, I really just use the opportunity. Uh, I was working with them then as well, but um, I, I use the opportunity to just help me learn how to speak with random individuals yeah. and to strike up good conversations and and how to learn to to talk with different people from you know from places that I'm not. I talk to Uber drivers all the time. My wife's like, why are you always talking to everybody? And I said, I, I literally teach people how to do better sales and marketing. Like I, that's where I came from before firefighting and I have a <laughs> gift of gab. And to your point, it wasn't always that great. It takes time. You got to right. put in the reps, right? So it's oh, like going yeah. into the gym. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah that, that's, that's definitely the, the thing that, you know, that has been a big kind of a growing experience for me. You know, I, I'm, I'm sure I don't sound exactly, you know, hundred percent professional now, but man, you should have heard me back in 2010. <laughs> that's funny. Wow. So that's crazy year too. That that's the year that I started firefighting was 2010. So that was 10 years ago, man. 10 years. Yeah. Ago. Yeah. We we talk about that now here because um the the same person that shot the video that I the, the first video that I did back in 2010 with IHMC is still he's still the media guy here at IHMC. He does all the video, all the audio work, podcast stuff, all of that. Oh, so like. Uh... Oh, let me just do some screen share again here. So one of the YouTube channels, you guys sent me like three different things. So yeah, all like, these YouTube channels are all, all, all this video work is him. That's all of his work. Okay. Yeah. yeah you got some good stuff here. Again, ladies and gentlemen, this will all be uh, linked in our show notes. So we always do at lithiefield.com. Uh, but yeah, one, one of the channels we're looking at right now is DRC IHMC robotics. There. That's, that's a good channel. You got 11,000. The other one's got 51,000. There you go. The IHMC. So, uh, but yeah, I saw the video work. I'm like, all right, you got a decent video guy. 
<laughs> oh yeah, yeah. Billy does great, um, and and that's really kind of the 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 biggest winner for us, uh, at least for me here at IHMC. You know, I come in, you know, in 2010, and I, I met all the engineers and everybody working on the project, and uh, and different engineers and and you know and interns and all that have worked on the project in and out. But we really just have an awesome team here that I've been, you know, you know, I, graced to work with. Really, I mean, yeah. all, all the people that I work with here. You know, there's Tyson in the glasses there on the right, Peter on the left. That's Jeremy now. And, you know, all these people that I've known for so long and, you know, and, and had the, the, you know, the opportunity to spend time with, they've taught me so much. And, and we've really just worked together so hard to come this far and, you know, hand in hand to get like this. And it's just really grateful for all these people, man, and especially the team that we have now. They're working super hard. Um, guys, uh, Brandon and Vishnu are out there now actually working on the EXO as we speak. Yeah. I mean, you guys, uh, so speaking of fitness, I was just making a joke about putting in the reps. So I'm playing a video for people who are listening to the regular podcast world. Again, this is always going to be on our Facebook channel and for Living Fuel and on the YouTube once, this, once the show goes live in the, in the podcast world. Um, but, I mean, dude, I, the reason why I picked this video is because being a ski race coach, like we said, slalom train, slalom, slalom, slalom. What happened there? What's going on? We lost a connection. Hold on, stand by. Hey, there we go. There you go. Hey, I can hear you. Yeah, stand by. We're reconnecting back up. Zoom, I think Zoom had a heart attack temporarily. I was wondering if it was us or them. It's raining here. I didn't know if we had a hurricane all of a sudden. I'm not getting audio. So, Mark, as we were discussing, uh, we're trying to figure out the right and wrong way about fitness and sometimes zoom gets a little argue with me and, and tries to kill our call. So as I was trying to ask you was there's obviously a lot of health and fitness involved in all of this type of stuff. And we were just talking about the whole, you know, you, you trying out, uh, uh, you know, driving people around just to improve communication. Right. So next thing you know, you're going from getting strong up top in the upper body, right. To get strong, getting in out of wheelchair for all these years. Now, now you're strapping on exoskeleton robotics stuff. <laughs> so, how do you prepare for that? Because there has to be, even though there's so much robotic assistance, that's still heavy, right? I mean, um, yeah. So, um, I mean, as far as uh, taking care of myself, you know, you know, keeping in shape, all those kind of things, upper body is what I can definitely exercise. You know, and, and I, I spend, I spend plenty of time every day getting my miles in on my chair. You know, of course, transferring in and out, things like that, and building up your upper body. You know, being in a wheelchair it should be. A, pretty regular idea you know these are only muscles you have as far as i'm concerned and the way i look at it is since these i have i have half my body i need to be twice as strong okay. and, you know and so i always keep that kind of regard um as far as you know the leg situation goes and the weight of the exoskeleton those kind of things weight bearing luckily the exoskeleton carries me and itself oh. so but it does it in a really cool way so the um the exoskeleton does pick up you know my leg and swing my leg but my right leg and is being held in a position in which my weight is being borne on my own leg. So the exo make, forces my body to carry my weight and it carries its own weight. Wow. So I really don't really feel the weight of the exoskeleton as much as I can feel the restriction of the exoskeleton being strapped to me. Okay. Yep. So that's what you see in the, uh, in, in all of them up until quicks, we had the uh, straps over backpack straps, you know, right. over the shoulders. And with quicks, we have like a cummerbund kind of deal that wraps around the midsection. So I was going to say, you know what? I was just looking at that. You guys yep. have your mock-up on the website. We were screen sharing that earlier. So this is quicks now, right? The, the mock-up here? Yeah, that's the uh, 3D design out of our uh, CAD system. So I, I agree. I don't see any strapping up top here at all. Yep. So... So Rather, where's, the, where's the bracing going to be involved in? Or? All right. So um, where you, on the screen now, the where your mouse is, that'll be thigh cuffs. They'll be, you know, of course, uh, Velcro. 
okay. cuffs that go around there that wrap my leg. Uh, yeah. Same thing with the knee with the knee braces. There'll be cuffs that go around there and wrap around Velcro. Uh, the feet we're actually using kind of like a, um, I think it's a snowboard strap system, the click straps. Yeah, like yeah. On, like on a motorcycle boot or something like that. And then for the um, for the midsection at the waist, if you look on the uh, the back or uh, it's yeah where your mouse is to the right. Yeah. Uh, yep, right there. You see the slots right there in the backpack area. Right. That's where uh, the cummerbund and all that stuff attaches. We actually got a, it's a lumbar support system. Uh, we actually ordered it just off of offline and then printed out some three D brackets to to mount that system like the lumbar support to the EXO. So we're using oh, that lumbar so you, support. There's already an existing lumbar support system that you guys liked, and yeah. you're just plugging it into your design. Yeah, so um, certain things are, you know, of course, from an engineering standpoint, it's easier to buy some things than it is to build them, right, you know, especially yeah. cost effective and all that kind of stuff. So we look online for, you know, anything that we can use. Unfortunately, with the exoskeleton and the, the, the degree of, you know, customization that goes on with that, that there is not really a whole lot that we can buy other than like electric motors, you know, you know, certain things like that. But even a lot of our uh, computer boards, stuff like that is all, you know, custom designed. Okay. So the ability for us to even find that lumbar support that we could use was was pretty amazing. So when we found it, that that just absolved the whole problem of us having to sort out, you know, how to fit me to the device better. Well, I mean, that's a good point. Like, why I mean, it, there's already so much innovation going on here in technology mm -hmm. and engineering as it is. Like, why would you why why would you want to become a lumbar expert? Okay, let's yeah. just okay great kit add it into the equation <laughs> yep that's actually uh one of our uh you know we try we're trying right now different ways to feed back information to me so you know level balance all those kind of things and uh we have a system that we that we've kind of put on the back burner which was um it gives us information based on some sensors in the feet and then that feedback was supposed to come back to me using a, a, vib a vibratory vest okay and, interesting um, yep so we have uh, i think it's, it's wooster or I always mess up the name. I say it wrong, but it's a Wooser vest. It's a um, first-person shooter uh, vest that you put on to play a video game with, and it has the, oh, so uh, if, you're, if you're getting hit by you know virtual Bullet. you know attacks, you can mm -hmm. feel where that would have actually hit you. Yeah, so where it came from, so it okay. gives you a sense of direction. Yeah. And so what we what we were trying to do is adapt that vest over to the exo feedback to where if I knew if I was leaning forward, I would get a vibration on my chest. If I'm leaning backward, I get a vibration on my back. But that's going to be, you're saying they're basing that tech off of sensors in the foot panels. Yeah, so we're versus, we, versus we not all. using a gyroscope concept at all. So. No, we are, we're using a, we use an IMU for, uh, you know, for the, the robot's ability to see itself in space, so balance and stuff. Okay. And then the feet sensors were like foot position. So am I, am I landing on my heel? Am I flat footed? Am I landing on my toe? Those kind of things. Yeah, I know this doesn't cross over, but I'm, I'm thinking about riding on a Segway. Like on a Segway, <laughs> like when you lean forward, it, you know, it goes. But the mm -hmm. machine has a virtual center of gravity, so it knows if it's actually starting to tip or fall over or not. I mean, obviously, part of the robotic design, they, they got to figure that out too, right? Like, make yeah. sure you don't accidentally fall over. I've seen some of your videos. Again, ladies and gentlemen, oh, yeah. you're going to have to go back and watch <laughs> some of the crash and burn events uh, of, of, his, of his journey. <laughs> I mean, oh, those those are the tamed down ones too. Billy won't put the good ones up. <laughs> why won't they put the good ones up, man? That's the viral stuff. We, you know, I, I tell you all the time. Insurance. I was like, well, there's that too. <laughs> I, I mean, here's the here's the cool thing. It's there's as as is my business brain, I can't help it. My like, guys, like, there's so many organizations, companies, etc., that have been afraid to share a certain percentage of content here. That my guys, like, when you get completely transparent and you get to that point where you're like. I don't care because I literally am at that point. I don't care what I say and what I do. That's why I love having a podcast, right? If I want to yeah. say shit, I say shit. Uh, it's not a big deal, okay? <laughs> it's, yeah. um, it's not the end of the world. But it's like, that's the point here. It's like, get to that point where, hey, man, show some of the blooper reel, right? Show some yeah. of the, the, the trials and tribulations of what you guys have had to go through. It's super cool. So Yeah, that that's actually one of the things that, that I think is actually, for me, the, the kind of the winning part of all of it is, you know, the failures, man, those show you your biggest mistakes and they show you where the cracks in your design are and things like that. And, and really people would kind of shy away from that when really those are the things that we should embrace the most. Okay. I, I embrace, you know, the fact that I'm in a wheelchair and the, the way that I know how to do that to its utmost is to look at the 18 year old kid that I was and remember that 
the more that I push forward now and learn and I'm able to teach other people in my position, then that's further than we can get away from that 18 year old kid that I was, hmm. you know, and, and, and I, I base a lot of what we do here, you know, and how I move forward on that, that perspective right there is like, I, I as much as, you know, I've, I've settled into accepting the fact that I'm in a wheelchair, that I don't accept the fact that anybody else has to be after me. So I want to pause on that kind of uh, point there, since you're, you're already hitting on it. It's like, are you actually out there, you know, speaking to other young kids or other other uh, people that have gone through some of the similar transitions you've had to go through to kind of, I don't know, public speaking, inspiring? Uh, he said you've had to grow your, your your speaking ability to get more comfortable. But I mean, I think your story is very inspirational. Is this something? Obviously, that's why you're probably getting on podcasts now, right? Just start getting the story out there so people learn about this stuff. So, yeah. Well, for me, I'm actually kind of doing that now. You know, I. I sp- like I said, I turned 18 years old and I spent five months of my adult life learning, you know, really getting into the rungs of an adult life. Yeah. And then that was, you know, and like I said, I'm not putting myself up there like a martyr, but that was taken away from me, you know, and it's really taking, taken me up to this point to where I feel comfortable and I'm happy enough with my own abilities that I can share more with other people. Okay. It took so long for me to really accept really accept the fact that this is where I'm going to stay and that my best role is to help make sure that other people don't have to suffer maybe like in some of the ways that I did. So that, that was, that's part of this is that it sounds like they need you just as much as you need them as far as this team, right? At IHMC, because, you know, as you guys keep advances this tech, like this is something that could eventually help hundreds, if not thousands of people one day, uh, fortunately and unfortunately, right? Like obviously we don't, I don't want to see somebody roll their truck seven times, uh, but there's some people who are, who are also born without the ability, you know, to walk yes. uh, and get around. Then you have uh, all of our first responders who possibly might have gotten, I mean, I've seen fire engines get rolled over in a car accident. And then the first responder who's there to save people is now injured, right? Uh, former military uh, getting, getting paralysis. All these variables uh, exist in this world. Like this thing is very impactful. Yeah, that's the goal. You know, it's not just as as much as I'm here because I'm paralyzed and I can't help the machine walk at all. I can evaluate solely on how the machine works. You know, that that's what that's what I hope to do is progress that forward. I can't help the machine any, but I can help them build a better machine. And as far as, you know, the hand in hand and us needing each other. I mean, we're all a bunch of friends. And at this point, you know, I'm I'm kind of a visualization for them as to who they're helping. And, you know, and the feedback from me will hopefully get us past some of the design flaws that we'll have if we don't have somebody like me with input. Okay. We can move past some of the design flaws that somebody in a wheelchair, somebody who is not in a wheelchair isn't going to recognize. So are you like the only pilot then, right? For, for their, everything they're doing? Yeah, for, for IHMC and the exoskeleton program, I'm the only one that wears the machine. I'm the only okay. one that tests the machine that, you know, that is paralyzed. Of course, they have a very strict protocol for before I get in the machine. Okay. And that is essentially everybody who works on the machine will more than likely do all of the functions before I ever get to them. Uh, and, those funct- okay. and those functions will probably have ran with the machine on a crane, you know, lifted into the air for hours upon hours before I ever step into the machine. And part of that's also for your safety too. Right? Yeah, absolutely. That, that's a hundred percent why we go through all those testings, why we always put them in it is because they can feel any tension or pull or anything that isn't appropriate. And we can work off of that. Once, once I'm in it, if the machine moves the wrong way or does the wrong thing, then we could potentially injure me, which sets the project back further. And, you know, of course, Definitely you know, don't want have, that. No, yeah, no. then we have to deal with stuff like that. But, you know, that's, that's, that's the cool thing about the team is we all kind of lay it out there for each other. You know, they ask me for honest feedback. I give them, you know, the most honest, it, I be, I am as honest with them as I possibly can be. And they are as straightforward with me as to what is possible, at least in the moment. So, I mean, God, so how many total years is now 13 years? Roughly? It's been 13 years for me in the chair in yeah. October, and it'll be uh, 10 years working with IHMC on okay, the so 10 project. years, that's right, 2010. So, <laughs> clearly, your mindset has shifted since 2010, right? I, oh, I, yeah. I, I can just imagine the levels of frustration or um, when stuff failed and didn't work. And I mean, one of your videos, you can see you're wiping the sweat off your brow, right? Like, it's, this isn't always easy. So, yeah, uh, how do you get over those always, initial hurdles? Um, all of the, I mean, uh, all that stuff just, I, I feel a little, I feel maybe a little kind of arrogant putting it this way, but uh, in my family, we don't complain and we don't take no for an answer. And if you want something, you work for it. 
There and if go. that means you got to go out there and you got to grind, then you go out there and you grind. If you got to go out there and you know and you get hurt, you get hurt. But when it comes down to taking care of yourself and the, the people around you and others that you could take care of, it's on you to do it. And sometimes that takes sacrifice. Yeah, I, I liked it because when in part of your bio, one, one statement said towards the end of it, I love it, was says, what I thought would ruin my life has given me more than I ever could have earned on my own two feet. Yep. And that's Absolutely. a pretty powerful statement. Yeah, I mean, but that took you a few years to realize. <laughs> oh man, it's taken me probably up until the last six months to fully recognize that. You know, I'm, I'm, I feel so arrogant in saying it this way, but it's really the only way that I know how to say it. And and I don't, I don't necessarily like having a lot of attention on me and stuff like that. I, I like to give you know the credit where it's due. The engineers built this exoskeleton. I'm here to break it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so but um, but really the idea of me being 18 and having to work my way up and do all the things I would have done. And I, and I would have, you know, I'd have built a house, had a family, you know, and all these things. And for the past 13 years, I've just been trying to understand what am I supposed to build now? And, and I've finally come to that, that I'm, you know, that I'm here to build this, hopefully help to build this exoskeleton. Um, I hope to help the, uh, the research team up at the VA in Cleveland fish, finish oh, their yeah. uh, BS research. And, um, and hopefully with all the technologies that are coming around and the ability to promote them and get them out there and show people that these are, are coming and they hopefully excite people and get them involved in it is, is really kind of my goal now. And it just took a long time to get there because of course you focus on your own problems and, you know, and, and now that I'm kind of done dealing with those hurdles, I'm here to kind of move forward. And the progress is just from little steps, you know, first it was, how do I get up this hill? How do I get into this chair? How do I get out of this chair? How do I get into this truck? How do I go to the river? How do I get in this canoe? You know, and since then, that's that's everything that I've I've set out to do. It has been that I, I want to find something that I'm either at the moment incapable of doing, or especially things that people tell me I couldn't do, or shouldn't do. Yeah, I'm not a big fan of I. You can't do that, or you shouldn't do that. I don't like people telling people what to do. So I can see there's some. <laughs> I can see there's some of that musk in you about that. It's like, oh, no, man. If you, if you haven't already re realized 13 years in the chair, like I've learned to overcome a lot of no's. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I get that. <laughs> I always get this. Um, people, you know, people will invite me over to, you know, their house or, you know, a, a business or, you know, or just a place that may not be perfectly handicap accessible. Yeah. And I always love it. They look at me and they say, uh, well, there's a couple stairs. And I always look at them. And the first thing is, well, how many stairs? Okay. You know? Because if it's two stairs, it's not a big deal at all. If it's 10 stairs, it starts to really become a problem. But okay. in that, you know, two, three, four, five range, I mean, if, am I going down the stairs? Uh, we can go down as many stairs as we want to go down. It's the going up part that's no fun. Okay. So, you, know, you, learn, you know, you learn those little things, you know, how, how do you, you know, how do you just take it as it comes and take it as a breeze, you know, roll down the stairs. And when we went to uh, the Cybathlon, we went to London and half of all the metro over there is you're lucky if you'll find an elevator, those kind of things. So, you know, in, in the past 12 years where I've learned to go down the stairs or maybe get out and crawl around on the ground, those are where you make your biggest improvements, the biggest challenges. You know, you can't make it through the sand. I'm going to make it through the sand. And you just fight for the next half an hour to make 10 feet. And then that's how you take it. I guess I'm just trying to picture fighting through sand. I'm like, that's actually, that's, that's a really good visual. Like that doesn't sound like fun at all. I mean, uh, I've I, driven a Jeep through sand. I've driven a quad through sand. I tried snowboarding on sand and I don't snowboard. So that's, that was, that was an ugly experience. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I'm with you, man. That's, that's a good visual for people hearing that right now. So, so, so what's next, man? I mean, we're, we're coming towards the end of our slot and I have another show coming up to this, but like, I want to make sure you like, obviously you got quick, quick is launching. You guys are building it now. Um, after all these years from then going from Atlas to what was the name of the old one? Mina? Mina. 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 Yeah. Mina. M -I -N -A. yeah. And that was uh, two versions or, or even more than that. So uh, right now we have, um, there's the, the first version, which was Mina. Then we have the second version, which was X1. The third version, which was Mina V2. And now we're on Quix, which is number four. I yeah, so imagine. You know, and man, that's, that, do, you guys, do you guys have like a man hours tracker? I mean, oh man, if we tracked hours, they'd have to pay us overtime. <laughs> I was going to say, like, <laughs> can you imagine the callous? Because I, I know a lot of passionate engineers and inventors, and 
because I was supposed to become an engineer and then I ended up switching to marketing and psychology, but I was studying to be uh, a mechanical engineer at Penn State here, well, this back in the late 90s. Uh, but, because uh, I actually had studied microelectronics technology in high school, I was, because I never planned to go to college. So I was studying uh, at a Bow Tech school and I geeked out about tech and I learned how to tear apart circuit boards and you know soldering and rebuild computers and all kinds of crazy stuff. So it was, I was actually like, oh, you go mechanical, do electrical engineering, and that's probably half of these guys on your crew, right? They got robotics engineers and everything else. So yeah, computer scientists, uh, electrical engineers, software engineers, mechanical engineers, everything in between engineer. Um, but everything in between engineer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, and everybody's been working very hard, you know, over the past ten years here at IHMC to, you know, to get the to, to the version that we're at now with the exoskeleton, and as grateful as I am for that, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm looking, still looking toward the future. And there's, there's so many things going on right now. We have, you know, we're coming out with quicks. We'll be done with that. And I'll be walking hopefully within the next couple of weeks in quicks. Cool. And, um, and then we'll be participating in the Cybathlon coming up, um, which is it's swapped over to an E event, but uh, we will be. I was gonna say, how are they going to do that? Again, your cam your camera guy is going to be on point, right? Everything's going to be oh, done yeah. out, of, out of your own oh, facility. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we're we're you know we're in the works of exactly how we're going to uh, to field the e the online event, but we're definitely going to be broadcasting it the best of our abilities, um, you know through uh, through here at the IHMC with our broadcast system and or YouTube and Facebook, I'm sure too. Yeah. Uh, and then we have the Toyota Mobility Challenge that's going to be coming up after that in September. Well, so Toyota's partnership was a big part of helping fund Quicks Quicks design, right? Like that was a big step up in sponsorship. Or I mean, you guys have a lot of sponsors, but. Yeah, um, actually, most of our uh, most of our sponsors are um, companies. Um, we did we did win the um, the Toyota Mobility Challenge, or not? We didn't win the Toyota Mobility Challenge. We won uh, the first grant, and then we won into the finals of the Mobility Unlimited Challenge. We're one of five teams right now participating in that in that for the uh, Toyota Mobility Foundation, and hopefully, we will win that one and move on toward you know, progressing our robot and moving toward like an actual production model in the future. I mean, we're talking about years, you know, and oh, yeah. that have to come before that comes, but it's been really great, you know, getting ready for the Cybathlon coming up and then Toyota Mobility Foundation has just been huge. We've had, you know, a lot of support from them, not just in the sense of, you know, a check, but also a lot of support and, you know, learning to understand engineering problems for the future and production and just lots of goals that they're help us, helping us work on and for the, for, for the future. Love it. Yeah. And then once, once we get done with um, the Cybathlon and the Mobility Unlimited Challenge, um, I'll have a little bit more free time and I'm getting ready to, uh, I'm building my own uh, little custom wheelchair that I'm going to work, that I've been working on, some mechanical advantage. I don't want to explain go. it whole, uh, all out right now, but I'm working on some mechanical advantage for a uh, custom chair for myself because um, after the Cybathlon in 2016, I took, um, I took a little break and I did, um, and I took my wheelchair to Delaware and started at uh, Cape and Lopen at the lighthouse at Cape and Lopen, Delaware at the state park and put my wheelchair in the water to uh, head towards San Francisco. And I started rolling down the side of the road from there. Oh. And I got 382 miles before uh, pressure sores and just, yeah. uh, and I'm doing it in a reg in just in my regular manual everyday chair. So just the time in the chair and the strain on my arms was just too much. I ended up getting some pressure. I, I have met a few cyclists who have biked across the country. <laughs> so. Yep. I could just imagine the that's all upper body, man. Holy yep. crap. So I did that and um and that was that was a lot of fun, but it's only ten percent of what I wanted to accomplish. So now I've kind of come up with this mechanical advantage here to uh, jump on a new bike and I'll be making it's gonna be thirty eight hundred miles. I'll go from uh, Cape and Lip and Delaware to the lighthouse out in San Francisco at Point Reyes. Oh man, we're definitely gonna be get to, see there you go. People listening that that's an excuse to follow all this stuff because that's pretty impressive. If you could pull out that feat. Uh, and what better inspiration to create another invention, right? Innovate your own wheelchair design. I know I've met a couple of adapted athletes in the CrossFit space, uh, one of which actually owns a, uh, a CrossFit gym here in Reading, Pennsylvania, and he's former military uh, par paraplegic, and uh, that guy's pretty inspiring. I mean, he, he does a lot of stuff in that chair, man, in and out <laughs> of that chair. I was like, and he's done his own, some of his own fabrication on yeah. the chair. So it seems like all you guys eventually get, get tired of like this certain, like, yeah, yeah, I can improve that. I can tweak that. Well, so well, half the time I've just realized that I'm, I, I, I pull things off my chair or I look at wheelchairs and I'm like, the guy that built that was not in a wheelchair. Yeah. 
<laughs> you, know, and, you know, and like people look at my chair, my chair is about as basic as they come. I don't have brakes. Um, the only things that can actually break on my chair that wouldn't be like, there's probably other broken parts of me is uh, the bearings, the bearings, okay. and I can flatten a tire. Other than that, there's nothing else that can break on my chair. There's no other things on my chair. There you go. Smart. Sometimes simplicity is, is best. So, yep, yep. Well, listen, Mark, I had a blast with you today. Uh, I, I hit that earlier. I had to get ready for another show, or else I keep chatting with you. I mean, uh, you guys, <laughs> you guys have had a hell of a journey. Uh, I'm excited for Quicks. The thing looks super cool. Uh, well, I mean, obviously, all your technology is cool. I went back over a lot of the videos. So, again, ladies and gentlemen, yeah. I'll tell you if you're hearing this now, go click on the YouTubes for these guys and go check out some of their history. It's pretty impressive. Like, it's been a hell of a journey. Uh, it's awesome learning about someone like yourself. I never knew there was a pilot program and all this other stuff. So <laughs> this is why I love podcasting. I, I get to learn something new. The listeners get to learn something new. Uh, so again, ladies and gentlemen, actually I'm going to share one more time. Make sure uh, you guys check them out at helpquicks.org is their main site there. And that's where we've been doing a lot of the screen sharing from tonight as well. Uh, so listen, Mark, I want to give you a, well, my last request for you. And I know you've been growing on your public speaking, so just bear with me. But I asked my guest co-hosts uh, to leave behind some final words or an all-encompassing message or what nowadays it's become is really more of like a legacy message. And you've had such a great transformation. It's like if people forget everything else we talked about today, like for you personally, like what, what would you like to leave behind for people as a message for them? <laughs> there's, there's so much that you can leave behind for people, but really the – the biggest thing is leave behind your worries about yourself and your own, you know, what you think you're not capable of. And anytime, anytime you think you're not capable of something, remember that you're always capable of going out there and failing at trying. And you'd rather do that than look back and realize that I could have done this, but I never tried. I like it. See, I see. Nailed that one too. All right. Well, listen, hang tight. I'll give you a proper goodbye off the air. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, I don't know what else to leave you with. Cool robotics, high-tech exoskeletons, uh, life-changing inspiration here. Some great final words for you all. Some great legacy messages with behind. So, again, that was Mark Daniel. Check out helpquicks.org. The IHMC is doing a lot and, uh, and a lot more to come. So, thanks for tuning in. Remember, ladies and gentlemen, we're here to fuel your health, your business, and your lifestyle. Mark helped us do that today. Thanks for tuning in. Remember, you too can live the fuel. Talk to you guys again soon.